our democracy isn't perfect. We must admit that the spoils go too often to uh, to the wealthiest among us, who are themselves the one who are the ones who are undermining democracy. Uh, and we have to reclaim the working class by pointing out that uh, the policies that they're backing it will result in the people that many of the people they don't like uh, being uh, humiliated, harmed. But it's the billionaire class behind this, and yes. uh, and you know it's cultural elites being targeted, like Yale professors, and you know maybe we certainly deserve some of that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> behind them are the business elite. Uh, behind these attacks are the business elite and the working class to 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 treat Elon Musk as a hero of the working class. Uh, that hypocrisy. Uh, must be uh, uncovered and and explained. Like, why is someone with hundreds of billions of dollars your representative? Looking at this, this researching this this kind of topics already for quite a a few years now. What I I I notice is that it's too it's rhyming too well to believe that the people running those operations, like QAnon, but there are many others, uh, and in the far right, they are not aware of the, uh, you know, of how the propaganda during the fascist and Nazi year was structured. Because they are, like uh, Heidi was saying, they are, they have certain, uh, let's say, archetypes uh, stories that archetypes target that they start you know working on one is the women so the women as witches so the the women are either the the um, ancillary you know um beings in in the, in the greater project of this uh, male dominated authoritarian world or if they don't want to take that position, they immediately become witches. They are attacked as witches. They are um, they are they are very much you know pushed on the side of society. So the moment that that you see in a in a free society women being pushed on the side, it's a pretty good you know indication to me that authoritarianism, authoritarian forces are at work. Is it that you're just now suddenly being discovered by more of a mainstream audience? Like suddenly it's like you just sort of, you know, uh, arrived on the scene. And why do you think it is when you've been doing this work this whole time? Right. I, I, my work has always been uh, on the margins. That is, I, you know, I think I have all the standards of a real professional journalist. I've been written for the New Yorker, the New York Times, Esquire, Vanity Fair for more than 50 years. And I published with the three biggest publishing houses in the country. And three of my books have actually been uh, bestsellers. Uh, but you know what, when it comes to uh, some of the allegations I, ma I make in them, the New York Times and other publications really shy away from them. And now we have uh, Trump running once again, of course, and I've done two books on him, uh, both uh, making serious uh, charges about him in Russia. Uh, one is how he laundered money for the Russian mafia, and I go into great detail on that. Another is how he was recruited uh, as an asset by the KGB, this dates back to 1980. Um, and again, both of those books made the New York Times bestseller list, but the New York Times refused to cover them in any way. Didn't review them, didn't write anything about it. And you don't find those allegations in, in, in the mainstream press at all. Uh, and I think they should be. Who are the people who do this work? Well, in Russia, there is a profession which is widely known Everybody knows it just as a plumber or a teacher or a conductor is called a political technologist. I'm sure most of you have never heard of such a profession because it 
does not exist in the United States or in the European Union. So political technologies develop sophisticated techniques based on psychology, history, and cultural and linguistic studies. And that's what they were trying to teach us at the Leningrad State University. They went for journalists. That's what they were trying to teach us at this classified course. And that's what political technologies do. Uh, the course was taught to philologists, people who study languages and literature, and journalists. Basic, the basic distinction is that there's a post-truth story, which invites you to doubt everything. Uh, and that's Russian propaganda. Soviet propaganda does give you an alternate ideological picture of reality and wants you to believe in it to the exclusion of other things. Yeah. So the aim is persuasion with Soviet propaganda. With Russian propaganda, the aim is depoliticization, uh, the generation of apathy and confusion. a true story but my gosh it takes us back to sort of Miami Vice and just all the craziness and excitement of the 80s but for you who lived through it you described it you described it as like this five-year slog can you kind of give our viewers uh more on what you uh meant by that well again I look at this saga whatever we want to call it or slog I look at it as a process that I didn't pick I didn't volunteer to investigate the CIA. No one said, hey, John, I've got an interesting case. Could you spend the next five years immersing yourselves with mercenaries, cartel leaders, and terrorists? That was not in my plan. And so as I got slowly drawn in to this process, it was alien to me. Miami, Florida was very alien to me. I'm from Wisconsin. I go to fish fries on a Friday. I don't go to a terrorist meeting in the Everglades on my Fridays. I sort of try to have a very rational world. So the world I got drawn into was a world that was not of my choosing. And slowly over time, I got sucked in to the point I couldn't get out. And it was a day to day, right. day in, day out, the war went on. Our country is under attack right, by propagandists, by foreign backed propagandists who are trying to change the brains of our citizens. And we need to fight that in every legal manner possible. And Julie is yeah. a sterling example of this. And, and within legal, um, civil means, you know, please be like Julie. Jim, thank you. Ahead. Thank you for that. That, that. And you're highlighting really the nugget uh, that, that we're all working on. And that you know, I'm talking strategies, and 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 uh, and uh, but but you're talking why we're doing it, and and it's because it's this network posing as news and fooling people into thinking that they're hearing news, and we're trying to get visibility and get the message across that it's a propaganda outlet. It's yeah. nothing but propaganda. And it's not, it's not like brainwashing. It is brainwashing. And yeah. we, know, we know how to deprogram one cult member at a time. We know how to do that. But how to scale up and deprogram a quarter of our country, it's, it, it's been incredibly painful to watch people I grew up with lose them. Yeah. 
lose their minds to actually evil, toxic poison. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's our motivation. And it's much, you know, that's a much more important thing than just our, our, uh, our logistics and our strategies. It, it's uh, what we're all, all of us trying to win back the soul of our country. We have, as Heidi was just saying, we have historical precedent for this type of thing occurring. Uh, you know, we have the Lebensborn program during World War II, and that correlates directly to what Russia is doing um, in Ukraine right now. But my question for you is, how badly has the media failed us when it comes to reporting this as not just something, oh, this occurred, no, it is an ongoing thing and continues daily. Um, why do you think the media, how, how is it failing? Why is it failing? What's going on here? Well, I, I think individual reporters and individual newspapers from time to time have done an excellent job as they do, but they, they, they follow a news cycle that is designed to attract attention briefly while something is new, it's shiny, it's exciting. And then we move on to the next thing. And we know from our experience of war and, and communicating about war in general, the excitement of war wears off pretty quickly. And so it is hard to find ways to, to reach and re-reach audiences with the shock of the old. And we've seen our stories about these children. We've, we've heard and we've seen some excellent reporting about them, but it's no longer new. It's no longer shocking. And therefore, the conversation moves on to something else. Prigozhin's death being the perfect example, where this is a very exciting story for a week. And that, too, was probably already beginning to die down. And the media will move on. So it's, it's more structural and about the way, the way that media chases or has to chase to stay, stay afloat stories and appealing narratives, even if it means long term, they lack the focus and lack the motivation to really pay attention to some of the bigger issues that are going on in the background of the war. It almost sounds like we're suffering right. from media-induced ADHD. Just wanted to say that even we in this conversation, we've been going, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes already. We've talked about the kidnap of children, the so-called evacuation of children, but we haven't talked about the murder of children. We haven't talked, and I apologize, this is going to be very bleak, so content warning. We haven't talked about rape of children or the sexual abuse of children, the torture of children. And all of that has been happening and continues to happen. But even we, the people that are paying attention, are not talking about it, which goes to, just goes to show how hard it is to continually force yourself as a consumer of this sort of material to face what's really happening. Basically, ever since Opus Day was set up, what it's done is go after the rich and the powerful. Um, the rich, for obvious reasons, they want their donations <laughs> to help the organization to fund um, its, its expansion. But they also go after the powerful because um, the mission of Opus Day is basically to re-Christianize the world according to its, you know, dystopian view of what that re-Christianization might mean. I think many Catholics would not recognize the re-Christianization that, that Opus Dei wants to push through. It's always gone after the elite because um, that's how you change society, through politicians, through the judiciary, uh, through billionaires such as, as Peter Thiel. So Ani Panula was posted at Silicon Valley and... Whilst he was there, yes, he, he formed a, a pretty close relationship with um, Peter Thiel. And in the book, I mean, I, I recount, you know, on the long walks through the Marin headlands around San Francisco, they would talk about, you know, their shared disdain for, for government. The title Vigilantes Inc., just so you know, that in 1946, the Ku Klux Klan had the same plan as the as Trump and and his uh, 2,000 Mules crew. They had a plan to knock off all the 
black voters of Georgia. And they succeeded and elected their own, the Ku Klux Klan leader, Eugene Talmadge, as governor of Georgia. But you know what? In 1946, Harry Truman said, that's illegal. And they were, and the FBI was about to indict Governor Challenge, Governor uh, Talmadge for challenging all these black voters. And, uh, but he uh, had an accident. He uh, had a collision with a bottle of bourbon, drank himself to death just before the indictment <laughs> came down. And you'll see this in the film. Yeah. But Vigilantes Inc. is the name that the Ku Klux Klan incorporated under. So Vigilantes Inc. is actually the name of the, the corporate name of the Ku Klux Klan. And Trump has literally revived the Klan plan for 2024. There were many of us um, out here. So I, I wrote a thread, as you can see, December uh, 30th before telling, you know, it, and it goes on to explain in, in detail mm -hmm. sort of how it was going to go. I warned uh, people on the left not to go because they were going to blame it on Antifa and it was, mm -hmm. gonna, you know, it was very clear exactly what they were planning. There were caravans of people being organized, um, you know, and, and as I said here, at some point, I'm afraid people are going to die mm -hmm. because they were, that was the, um, the, that was the intent. That was the, the intent. intent. It was the express intent of these people. And all you had to do was watch it. And so for me, the, the, the thing that I cannot get my head around is how one, you know, this Twitter guy and some other people figured this out and our entire intelligence, you know, um, infrastructure, um, could not warn people like you what was going to happen so that you could protect yourself and the people that work for you. Uh, to me, it's, it's just, uh, one of the great mysteries, and and I'm sad that the, the, the points were not connected, that the tips that were not put in were not, um, you know, taken seriously so that, you know, a lot of trauma and injuries and death could have been prevented. And I agree with that. I mean, it's the, the miscommunication or not connecting the dots to, to uh, imagine what, you know, the worst case scenario, because, you know, after the election, I think it was November, uh, the following week or immediately after the election, when Trump declared uh, himself the winner without no evidence that he was such, um, he began to plan about this. I remember a um, interview that he did with uh, Chris Wallace a couple of days before the election, I believe. Uh, and where Chris Wallace asked him uh, whether he would go out peacefully uh, if he were to lose the election. And he said, we'll see. And I, I took that as immediately, okay, he's he's not going to leave uh, peacefully. Yep. He's going to, just like he fear, uh, Fury um, antagonist, a uh, speech during his inauguration day that culminated with the American carnage uh, yes. line on it. That's how he exactly ended up with American carnage at the Capitol. Yep. Uh, so he began uh, projecting what would happen if he were the president. And after he lost the election, he decided to uh, claim, uh, hold on to power. We speak about agents of influence and we completely stick to the definition then this is actually somebody who works it's almost like a, they have a deal they, they get paid yeah for for the job it's not the way we use that term now because in most cases unfortunately we don't know are they paid or not and it would be wonderful to know it we have one case German journalist. He wrote a book about Putin. He was always extremely close, extremely apologetic of, of Putin, defending him, defending his policy. And he was invited to TV, to many events. And suddenly in, in 2023, the world learned because of investigative, um, investigative journalism that he received 600,000 US dollar from 
um, oligarchs close to Putin. Yeah. And this is the best thing that ever can happen to you because now everybody understands the context of, of his communication because this guy was presented as a journalist. One piece of data I'll add to that is CNN reported in, in late May uh, the staggering numbers that Betsy DeVos's own organization called the American Federation for Children, sort of a... a, a, a uh, an odd name, but they uh, they have spent two hundred and fifty million dollars, according to their own accounting, on bringing vouchers to the states since twenty thirteen. Two hundred fifty million dollars, and for that they've gotten back twenty five billion dollars. Again, this is all their own numbers. This is CNN got a hold of an investor deck, so twenty five billion dollars in exchange. Um, for, for that 250 in spending. That means that for every $1 DeVos organizations have put into privatizing education, they've gotten $100 back uh, in public spending for private education. That My final question is, is very simple. It's simply a yes or no answer. Um, one of the things we talk about on this show and, and one of the things I try to get our audience to understand is currently we are experiencing a class war in which billionaires uh, and their lackeys are doing everything they can to dismantle the administrative state that created the middle class, uh, helps out the lower class, and tries to bring things into a more equal and just society. Uh, would you agree that the school vouchers are part of the class warfare uh, that we are experiencing today? Yes or no? Yes. aren't many of these what I'm labeling dissidents in the group. There are a few, but whenever they raise concerns like this, you know, it's basically they're shouted down by everybody else. I mean, all they want to do is bomb, invade, overthrow. And then they also very explicitly talk about the need to crack down on their domestic enemies in ways that are quite alarming. What mystifies me is that our intelligence services can warn Putin ahead of time that a terrorist attack was, was happening on his soil, but they refuse to warn Americans that we're being attacked by Putin's information war. All day, every single day, I track it constantly. Yeah. And and I'm and I know it's not necessarily you know, your expertise, but I'm very curious what your thoughts are about why our government, our intelligence community, our military refuses to recognize this threat for what it is, um, which is a, a very deeply dangerous, subversive psychological warfare campaign that is, in my view, captured somewhere around the, a third of the country. And, and I don't understand why we haven't warned, explained, or pushed back in any way on this, at least in my view. Well, I, um, I, I don't know it in as much detail as you are. It's not my particular focus and so on. But I can't help but look at it in a, in a broader perspective. I've, um, as in my in my life, I've grown to admire so much about the United States. And one of them is how the United States has managed to um, successfully institutionalize ideas about liberty and, and so on and build a enduring uh, democratic institutions to sustain that. And that's been incredibly admirable. And a kind of ingrained tolerance, things like freedom of speech and so on. But the consequence of that is the United States has historically been really bad at dealing with actual treason. In America, uh, we still pretend that we're not even infected. <laughs> operatives? What operatives? There are no operatives here. <laughs> 
We're so bad at dealing with actual treason, to quote Michael McKay. We are so bad at dealing with actual treason. Oh, yeah. Well, that's all. You know why? Because then you have to admit that there may be people internally, domestically that are helping them. And that's politically a suicide. So that's why it's, you know, it's easier to to put it frankly, it's easier to, you know, catch a spy, let's say. And and then the problem is, is that, okay, you can catch them, but then they have connections internally right so um you know those get exposed this is it's the connection between these seemingly disparate events but the 6th january insurrection the riots in in the uk the war in ukraine you know the elections of donald trump the elections of nigel farage these are not things which are disconnected they're intimately connected and they're part of not necessarily i mean this, some people would say oh so you're talk- what you're saying is you're, you're you're referring to a conspiracy theory no we're not talking about a giant singular cabal this is a heterogeneous network of people who actually disagree with each other on lots of things but they're getting more and more aligned around these shared alternate realities you know these shared crazy ideas and i think i think that one of the things that i've found most scary about this and i think I, I, when I came across um, Jim, your uh, your your Substack recently, and I, I was like, wow, this guy gets it, because I, I've been for the last few years have been saying, guys, we're not just dealing with neo Nazis; these are literal Nazis, like actual Nazis, that like they actually believe really crazy Nazi ideas, and they don't want us to understand that, and there's very few of us who recognise how deep that rabbit hole goes. And I'm going to quote you, if you've ever wondered what you'd be doing before the Second World War, well, you're doing it now. And so many of us are doing our best to engage in mimetic battles. And we here are engaging in mimetic battles. But I think this is what you're doing in World War, if this were the run up to World War II, this is exactly what you're doing right now. And I think that, um, okay, I got like three more things, but I know probably High Fire Jim has something else and lightning round. How do we get the world to get off their butts and start treating this stuff as seriously as they should? I'm well, I'm yeah, I work full time on it. I think all of us are trying our best. I mean, it goes back to this. Let's go back to right the beginning about the stealth genocide idea. So it's this idea that I was inside what I understand now was a stealth genocide. What they were Russia was preparing the ground to um, teach and inculcate in Ukrainians in in Russia occupied Ukraine that they weren't Ukrainian and preparing them to kill uh, their fellow Ukrainians. And for the Russian, it doesn't matter who's killing whom, the point is to get rid of Ukrainians. And if I, as an internationally trained lawyer from the esteemed Cambridge University who had studied the Holocaust and stuff was inside this world for seven years and I didn't realize it, yeah. Uh, then I, I think that's a good little parable to say we, um, we've just got to keep uh, what I call our incoming troll radar. Палацах, поза шкільна освіта, освіта, інститути. І діти, коли дізналися, що я потрапив на фронт, вони почали передавати через мене вітання героя. Готові? Добре. Тоді уважно. Вітання від дітей. Моє ім'я Валерій Дзех. Я військовослужбовець 59-ї бригади, а також є учасником культурного десанту, і я там лялькар. Я хочу, щоб військові в якийсь момент просто опинилися в своєму дитинстві, щоб вони згадали, що таке дитинство, що таке мріяти і що таке створювати, будувати. Крок за кроком. Іти вперед до своєї мети. Ебера коза, на юрна та й соле, на ріа серена, допона там песа, фе на ріа.
Regina fresca, pare Regina festa, che bella cosa, na giornata e sole. Fronti a te, o sole, o sole mio, stai in fronti a te, stai in fronti a te.